Welcome to the Dr. Journal Club Podcast, the show that goes under the hood of evidence-based integrative medicine. We review recent research articles, interview evidence-based medicine thought leaders, and discuss the challenges and opportunities of integrating evidence-based and integrative medicine. Continue your learning after the show at www.drjournalclub.com. Please bear in mind that this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Talk to your doctor before making any medical decisions, changes, etc. Everything we're talking about, that's to teach you guys stuff and have fun. We are not your doctors. Also, we would love to answer your specific questions. On drjournalclub.com, you can post questions and comments for specific videos. But go ahead and email us directly at josh at drjournalclub.com. That's josh at drjournalclub.com. Send us your listener questions and we will discuss it on our pod. All right. This is Josh and Adam reporting to you live, not live, reporting to you about mistletoe. This is a uh, an article recommended by dear colleague and listener, Jacob Shore, who is a amazing human outstanding kayaker and naturopath extraordinaire, major leader in getting naturopaths on board with evidence-based medicine and looking at evidence from the get-go. So he's a listener, and you should be too, and you are if you're listening, so that's not super helpful. Um, Anyway, he recommended that we talk about this paper, and uh, it was a good one. Now, very rarely do I ever hear Adam say, oh, this is a good paper. Well, Josh. Let alone if it's recommended from a listener. (laughs) So... We might not have listeners. We might we might not have some listeners. We might have people who are like, oh, it's good background noise. We don't want to be background noise. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, they could the, the numbers could be juiced by people just like letting it play out or auto download or something. That's true. So for those who are listening, this is a this is a paper we'll we'll do the show notes link. Mistletoe extract in patients with advanced pancreatic cancer. This is the mistrail. Mistral? Mistral? I was gonna. I want to say mistrial. Mis mistrial, mistrial. Yeah, but but yeah, it sounds like mistrial because it you know, kind of was a mistrial. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So this just when did this come out? This come out this year or? Yep, twenty twenty four. I believe it was in May twenty twenty four. Okay, cool, 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 cool. You want to you want to walk us through the uh, background and methods, or how how would you like to proceed, sir? Yeah, let's start off with uh, with some of the background because uh, for anyone who's who's not aware, uh, mistletoe, also known as viscum album, which is the the Latin name, is is basically an herb. Uh, or actually, it's not an herb. It's 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 kind of like mo- the way I think of it is like a moss that grows on trees, a parasite or something, right? Parasitic plant because it's a shrub, but it's hemiparasitic, mm-hmm. in meaning it, it like feeds off of the the tree that's on it. The the most common one that that Westerners are probably aware of is the European mistletoe, and it's 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 being looked at uh, particularly in oncology settings because it has a mechanism of action where uh, basically it can be immunomodulating and some you know anti-inflammatory components to it, and typically in in these oncology settings it's um, it's being administered as an injection um, and, the, and the injections are they can be pretty intense uh, which is one way that like mistletoe is kind of notorious in in these oncology settings oh what do you mean that's interesting I, I didn't know that what what happens yeah it often has like an injection site reaction type of um, it's like a local skin irritation it's pretty common with them especially at higher doses um, it is not FDA approved for treatment. Uh, we are not making a treatment recommendation. This is not medical advice. We're just educating people on on this, by the way. And so it, there, there is some interesting research on it. However, a lot of the research has flaws from a methodological standpoint. So even anything that is sort of like interesting is really needs to be taken with a grain of salt, especially when you're using it for uh, things like cancer, uh, very serious, very serious health conditions. Right. And in, in Europe, it, it does seem to be not approved, but a little bit more um, utilized, if you will. Yeah, it sounded like it was pretty regular thing to do. And they were like trying to find location. I wouldn't say regular, but more more well accepted uh, amongst the community there. Yeah. And 
Um, basically, the, the basis of this trial is uh, from, from data that came from a previous trial looking at the use of mistletoe for um, cancer, specifically looking at uh, like health-related quality of life and if it helped to extend life. Yeah. Um, and that, that trial was conducted, I believe, uh, it was in one of the Baltic states, I believe uh, Serbia, I want to say, or, or maybe Slovenia. Um, it was known as the MAP, I, I called it the MAPAC trial, M-A-P-A-C. Mm -hmm. It was a trial with pretty robust results. However, uh, again, from a methodological standpoint, it was an it was a open labeled randomized control trial, so there was no blinding, um, and so you know the, the results were likely um, unconfounded there. But, but 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. But I'm not sorry, not not confounded, but but inflated. Well, I mean, maybe, but I mean, maybe the the quality of life outcomes. But they saw a be a survival benefit. I, mean, I think it's a hard hard push to say blinding impacts survival benefits. Well, I mean, we would have to look at the trial, look at, you know, look at that trial specifically to see. Yeah. 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 So, so to your, to your point, like you had this promising study, but there were flaws. And so this was meant to kind of like, what, like say, okay, let's do this, but do it even better and see if we still see the same effects. Exactly. Yeah. And so that, that one was done in, in 220 patients with advanced pancreatic cancer. Big, so big study. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so in this trial, they're essentially repeating exactly what was done um, in that trial uh, in, in participants with advanced pancreatic cancer, but being utilized in Sweden specifically. And, and blinded. And blinded, yeah. So this was a much more rigorous trial. It was a double-blinded, randomized controlled trial where the, the blinding was basically everyone across the board was blinded. It was a publicly funded trial. Uh, which is great. So there was no industry sponsorship. However, industry did sub, uh, did provide supplies of of the mistletoe as well as as placebo. Right, and it seems like the, maybe you know this better than I, but it seemed like there's like a very specific extract that is used from this company. Yes, and so I was the whole time I was wondering like, how do you know that you got the product right? But it sounds like they were using the standard extract that kind of everybody uses, and that they used in this. Map hack study or whatever. Yeah, there's different ways of extracting it. So you can ferment mistletoe or not, and then you can use you know aqueous solution. So are you extracting it in in water? Are you extracting it using alcohol, like an alcohol base? Um, and I believe in this one it was uh, it was a fermented alcohol base, uh, and they got it specifically from an oak tree. Interesting. So they were very. Uh, it was very like well well uh, described, characterized. Yeah, resourced and, and and how they described it and characterized so this way, which is good because future trials really ought to do that of like, OK, you know, I think that's part of the issue when it comes to like botanical medicine is, OK, well, what were the growing conditions? Where were they grown? You know, maybe, you know, basil, something like, like you know, basil in, in New York might be different from from basil in Italy or or something like that. You know, the, the growing conditions might be different. So, yeah. And especially if it's parasitic on a tree like it's important to know what tree it was growing on right or or any of the organisms that like interacted with it mm -hmm. so there is yep you know there's a lot of things there that we that we need to take into to consideration so so this was so just to I, you already said this but i just want to underline this so it's not like they picked a random intervention they used the same one that was very promising in this other study and it's the same patient population, too, it looks like. The initial study was an advanced pancreatic cancer, and this patient population is advanced pancreatic cancer. So it really was trying to confirm this very impressive finding, but in a more robust way. Like, there wasn't a lot of deviation that I saw between the study they were basing this on and this study. Exactly. Yeah. And, and they also picked Sweden specifically um, because Sweden has... According to these to these authors, it's it's more uh, mistletoe is more widely recognized, and they also have uh, already like well integrated multidisciplinary oncology uh, settings, and so it would just kind of from a practical standpoint be a little bit easier to carry out from a logistic standpoint. You know, they, everything's already in place. Yeah, yeah, very cool. And I, I just a quick comment on the material. You said it was fermented. I, I did, I mean, if I learned, I must have learned that at, in, in, at best year, but like, I, I didn't even not know that. I just not recall that. I mean, it's really kind of cool to think about like a fermented extract. Very, very interesting. And I guess that's traditionally how it's been uh, used. But anyway, yeah. So we got this, uh, 
And you had said it's different ways of extraction. It looks like this one was an aqueous extract. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Very good. Exactly. And so the so the whole point of this trial, just to kind of uh, uh, tie up some loose ends, was that they're, they're trying to see if adding on mistletoe extract administration to standard treatment mm-hmm. compared to placebo plus standard treatment right. could prolong survival, overall survival, as well as health-related quality of life yep. in people with advanced pancreatic cancer. And for this Um, the standard treatment was palliative chemotherapy or just like best supportive care Mm -hmm. and palliative chemotherapy, meaning, you know, you know, can, can there be a little bit of additional benefit in preventing, you know, further cancer growth, but ultimately knowing that, um, you, you basically, you're so advanced that it's, it's likely to, you know, likely going to end life. Pancreatic cancer is not one of those more forgiving cancers. Um, the the mortality rate is quite high with it, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's like, okay, if if you're healthier and you can kind of withstand treatment, but we know that it's likely a terminal diagnosis, but we're trying to kind of get as as much life extension as possible, perhaps we can go forward with it. Yeah. Or your baseline might be pretty deteriorated, and adding on more chemotherapy is unlikely going to really either add much benefit to to quality of life it may worsen it or uh, it may not extend uh, life out with much significance and so perhaps it really it's just about overall you know providing best supportive care and letting them see out the best the, the, the best of their their life that's remaining yeah absolutely and um yeah advanced pancreatic cancer is not a good one we're talking about maybe a few extra months of survival if things go well right and I think, you know, the other thing that I, uh, you said this again, but I want to underline this is that this was in addition to sort of standard of care, but it's not one of these integrative studies that we're used to seeing where you've got standard of care and then one group gets additional integrative medicine. It's that or a placebo. So it's still a placebo controlled trial. And so we're basically saying like, is adding this on any better than placebo when you already have all this other stuff on board? Um, so again, this is not a A plus B versus A. It's A plus B versus A plus placebo B. Right. And the placebo was was ide- exactly identical to mistletoe in how it looked and how it, I would assume, how it would feel and, and how it was administered. So it was still, you know, injected and, and whatnot, which I think is important. Yeah, but to your point, man, like I think they mentioned that, like if you look at the adverse event, well, maybe I'm foreshadowing, but like, when we jump later, you said this it's very common to get these adverse reactions, and they did see a dramatic difference in adverse reaction between the placebo and mistletoe, duh. Um, and that, but that's a big concern for blinding, for masking, right? Like, yeah, maybe it started off as blind, but you know, it, it would be very obvious to to medical staff and to perhaps the participants if they know to expect this if it didn't happen versus if it did happen. So we have to think a lot about even though it was placebo controlled, did that blind last or was it unmasked during the trial right right no i mean i think it's a good point but i mean but which way would it that bias though right like which way would that bias that would bias towards benefit right because you would know that you got the mistletoe and so you might expect a better outcome so you know if this was a positive study you might say oh maybe we've got an issue there if this was a negative study, then again, it's not just that it's biased or potentially biased, it's the direction of expected bias. So if anything, you would expect this to look, make things look rosier. But if the results are not rosy, then you don't really have to worry about it because the direction's not there. Exactly. Okay, cool. What else you got? Over, but overall, if, if you have the chance to read this paper, I actually really like the way it was outlaid, uh, the, or uh, how it was reported. Like it was really I was surprised it was kind of in this obscure journal. Right. It was in a like a German journal. Yeah. But it was very well done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was a very well done, very well reported. Like, yeah, this was an excellent read. You heard it here. Adam likes the study and it's on integrative medicine and he likes the study. Uh, but I agree. It, it was super well done, I thought. But and I was surprised by the I had the same thought. I was like, huh. If it's, you know, you think of small, like a randomized controlled trial result in a small, or at least, I don't know if it's small, but I didn't know about this journal, uh, maybe 30 people or something. No, this is like a, you know, 300 person randomized controlled trial, well conducted, you know, you, you kind of expect this in BMJ or something. Yeah. 
but yeah, it was a it was a double blind randomized placebo controlled trial across nine different uh, oncology centers in Sweden, uh, where people who had a recent diagnosis of advanced exocrine pancreatic cancer or a relapse of cancer, and they did actually do analyses where, from a sensitivity analysis standpoint. Um, tease that out of like, okay, do the results differ in people with new diagnosis versus uh, recurrent? And just for sake of time, um, there was no difference when when looking at that. Mm-hmm. And the people who entered the trial, um, basically, they they had, from a functionality standpoint, were a little bit on on a less severe standpoint. They have what's called the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group Performance Status, or the ECOG where lower scores indicate a healthier or more of like a robust health from a, from a baseline standpoint. Um, so if you had an ECOG score of one, that would be much better uh, than someone, a score of five is, is mortality. Mm-hmm. So if you were, you know, in, in this trial, they, they recruited people with a baseline that was less than or equal to two. So people who, for the most part, are, are functioning well, Um, And if there's any sort of limitations, they're not, they're still able to do like their activities of daily living and whatnot. They're not like completely decompensated uh, baseline. Um, And they needed to have a life expectancy greater than four weeks. Mm -hmm. It makes sense for what they're trying to find with with this trial. Mm -hmm. And then uh, basically just needed them to not be pregnant, breastfeeding, um, all sort of like the kind of standard stuff, not using any sort of other immunomodulating things. Uh, agents making sure that no one had um, uh, like an autoimmune disease, um, anything like that, or being treated for an autoimmune disease. Um, pretty, I didn't really have any sort of issues with the inclusion exclusion criteria. Did you? No, nope, not at all. And they they tracked again very closely with this MAPAC trial, including for the intervention, same intervention, same dosing, same adaptation of dosing. So again, they're like, this looked really promising. Let's see if we can repeat this with uh, blinding. Right. Um, People who were also excluded was um, really anyone who had a prior experience with mistletoe or if they had any sort of known hypersensitivity to to mistletoe components. Makes sense. Which probably means that they they knew about this skin injection site reaction. Look, the thing is, we don't do this for money. This is pro bono. And quite honestly, the mothership kind of ekes it out every month or so, right? So we do this because we care about this. We think it's important. We think that integrating evidence-based medicine and integrative medicine is essential. And there just aren't other resources out there. The moment we find something that does it better, we'll probably drop it. We're busy folks. But right now, this is what's out there. Unfortunately, that's it. And so we're going to keep on fighting that good fight. And if you believe in that, if you believe in intellectual honesty in the profession and integrative medicine and being an integrative provider and bringing that into the integrative space, please help us. And you can help us by becoming a member on Dr. Journal Club. If you're in need of continuing education credits, take our NANSIAC approved courses. We have ethics courses, pharmacy courses, general courses, interact with us on social media, listen to the podcast, rate our podcast, tell your friends. These are all ways that you can sort of help support the cause. Yep, all makes sense. Got no problem with inclusion criteria or the intervention um, or the design. Oh, I just want to point out the design. So statistically, so they were very careful and did a good job about intention to treat analysis, right? So they tracked loss to follow up and and all that, but they actually analyzed as per the allocation, which is very, very important for intention to treat analysis, uh, especially if there's differences in uh, follow in, in um, continuation of treatment, which there was here, which we'll get to in a second. But yeah, they did everything kosher from a ITT or intention to treat analysis perspective. They did also look at per protocol and report it separately in case people were interested too, but they're very clear on their primary outcome. Yeah. Um, and then when they administered uh, the mistletoe and the placebo, they basically titrated them up to the most, to the highest maximal dose. Mm-hmm. And then uh, followed them up um, basically on a on a monthly basis up until nine months, um, or which was the end of the trial. And then the the primary outcome that they looked at was overall survival, and then the secondary endpoint was health related quality of life, and then other secondary endpoints that I thought were were reasonable were. Um, glucocorticoid use, so meaning like, did we have to use any sort of like salvage therapy to try to get 
you know, it kind of improve sort of their function and, and response to, to treatment and, and the cancer. They looked at safety outcomes. Um, and then they, they said that they were going to look at body weight. I wasn't able to find those results anywhere. They said they're going to publish them later, I think. Publish them later. Okay. And then. Yeah. They're saving their secondaries for another publication. Great. Um, and then they they did um, trial, uh, or excuse me, they did, they published not only their protocol um, uh, prior to this trial being done, but they also registered their trial and in what looked like uh, both European and U.S.-based registries, which was really cool. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. Yeah, they did a great job. Uh, no concerns whatsoever from a methods perspective besides the concern for potential blinding, which is not a quality on them. It's just the manifestation of the intervention. Yep. Basically, they just needed 290 people in the trial, which is what they got, um, which is pretty consistent with the prior trial, which needed 220. Um, so this one had 290, so a little bit more, and, and kind of, but still, still consistent with everything. There were 143 people who were in the mistletoe extract group and 147 in the placebo group. Within the mistletoe extract, 140 um, received therapy, and in the placebo group, 143 received therapy. Uh, 32 people uh, discontinued intervention uh, in the mistletoe group, and really the majority of that is what I kind of understood as really just like treatment fatigue in general, which is pretty pragmatic of like people just saying, hey, you know what, I'm, I think I'm done with treatment um, and just kind of want to live out the rest of my life. Mm. I had a different take on that because if you look at the other side, placebo, you only had 18 people discontinue versus you almost have double that. I thought it was because of the reactions. But they did discontinue. Yeah, but twice as many people. They did discontinue for basically the same reason, though. Right. So like that's the like that's the question. So I think it was I think it might have been the reaction. They didn't like the reaction, the localized reaction. I'm trying to look here. It might be me reading between the lines here, but there was a dramatic difference in the skin reaction. So like 93 out of 140 people who got the actual mistletoe had these skin reactions versus like two people in the placebo group. So, yeah, I tried I tried I guess I piece tried to piece out E table one uh, at the end. Of the oh, OK, but then I realized that that was for all the people who did not who would ultimately decided not to enter the trial or they combine the two so they didn't actually hash that out so you might be right there so that's a good point well i guess the reason i'm harping on it is like if the reason if you have an imbalance and the reason for the imbalance is related to the intervention or the outcome you have a potential bias issue and the concern is this may be related to the intervention because it causes these you know these reactions again however this would be a major concern if you did like a per protocol analysis or something like that. They did analyze as as allocated. So that was all good. And again, the direction of this concern that I have would be to make things look rosier than they are. And if we don't see a rosy result, it's sort of a non issue. But that's why I'm kind of harping on it is like we do see this doubling of dropouts. And I think you can make an argument that the dropouts have to do with the intervention. It's not it's not necessarily random. And we do also see that, you know, when looking at both intention to treat and pro-protocol analysis, the results were essentially preserved. Yeah, that was cool. It's nice to also report per protocol, but just not harp on it, which is exactly what they did. They put it in an e-supplement, but they said that basically the results were the same. So even with all these concerns, um, again, everything is still looking like we can trust the results. Yep. And then at baseline, for the most part, um, the characteristics of, of participants was pretty well balanced, um, with the exception of a couple of changes here and there with regards to where people's cancer staging was at um, and whether or not they had a, a new diagnosis or if it was a relapse. But I think they even did like, a, didn't they do like a sensitivity mm -hmm. analysis later and said, no, that, that won't impact the results either, right? Even though there are... yeah. So that's common. Like if you do, you know, you randomize people, but just by random chance, sometimes the groups look different and you want to make sure that the results that you see are not because of that difference. So they did that as a sensitivity analysis and they did not see any, a signal there either. Yeah, I think they did four sensitivity analyses um, looking at different things um, and they, they just didn't find any really changes in the results, which is again, uh, which is good from like a consistency standpoint and like how, how, how much 
can we believe in these results? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Love it. Loving it so far. They did a really amazing job. Yeah. So when we look at the primary uh, outcome, which was again overall survival compared to placebo, we saw that there was no there was no difference. Yeah. The adjusted hazard ratio was a one point one three, uh, and that confidence interval was a zero point eight nine to a one point four four, um, and yeah, it just it just did not change. Yeah, that's a shame. Um, and then yeah, they did all all their sensitivities about the same. Yeah. And actually, from like a nominal standpoint, the the median overall survival was seven point eight months in the mistletoe group versus eight point three in the placebo arm. Right. So nominally, uh, even a little bit worse, but not statistically significantly different. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, there was also no change uh, in the health related quality of life compared to to, to either group, um, and they had ninety nine percent questionnaire completion rate. So. Yeah. And no loss to follow up, man. They had no loss to follow. Up. It was a well conducted study. There's no no loss of data there. I mean, if you look at figure two as well, uh, when they look at overall survival um, from start of treatment to treatment period to the, excuse me, end end of the treatment period. Mm -hmm. So from from when they entered the trial until month nine, just looking at that, basically the lines are right on top of each other. There's no there's no divergence. Um, and then they said, OK, well, what if we do it? for the entire follow-up period as well after after the the treatment was administered and again we see no divergence at all they're just basically on top of each other the entire time yep yep that's totally true so it's like okay well maybe maybe the effects uh you know you need longer to see the effects and yeah up, up to what uh four years later right um no no difference yeah um i thought that the discussion section um i did read it just to kind of see what to see if they would compare their results to the <laughs> you must have really liked the paper <laughs> i did and i wanted to see what like they how they compared to the mapac trial and they you know they, they i thought that they were very uh neutral in their tone as to how they compared to the mapac trial mm -hmm. agree yeah they i again they just really and they had some you know thoughtful analysis which is what you're supposed to do or thoughtful discussion which is what you're supposed to do in the discussion like why did it work in that trial but not this one so they talked about blinding is the obvious one but they also said you know differences between uh serbia and uh you said sweden right yep um and i thought that was interesting that they um and i might be stealing your thunder here but that there might have been like a ceiling effect so like in uh, Serbia, let me see if I get this right. In Serbia, they said there's not as much. It's not having this sort of uh, great care and um, end of life additional care is not common, and so there might have been additional benefits to glean from something like mistletoe. Uh, but that in Sweden, it's very standardized to do all these advanced sort of end of life advanced pancreatic cancer care, and so you might have already got all the benefit you could get from additional interventions, and you sort of had that ceiling effect and the the mistletoe was not able to add anything to that which is also useful information um but so they they conjectured a little bit on that um i thought that was that was interesting i wouldn't have, i don't think i would have thought of that on my own yeah yeah sometimes you know when we read negative trials or quote unquote negative they're reported as negative because the results are not statistically significant so people kind of view them as like oh well this doesn't really add to science but i i really think the complete opposite especially if it's something that's really well conducted of like mm -hmm. there was no bias really going into this paper if anything it was kind of mistletoe leaning mm -hmm. and they were like hey we were actually kind of surprised with the results that we got given just how robust the findings were in the mapac trial totally and like it's just it's just an unfortunate finding. Like they, they did a really good job. They got the product from the correct industry. They used a multidisciplinary team. They did ev they did everything right, like as much as you could. And so, yeah, they just did. There's just nothing there. Yeah, there's nothing there. You know, if we were to do a grade on this, it would be it would be high, right? We would probably have a high grade score and unlikely to change you know, outcomes moving forward, at least when it comes to advanced pancreatic cancer. Now, we can't say, will this apply to, you know, breast cancer, colon cancer, any other types of cancer? We can really only say, hey, in, in a European 
a patient population, um, you know, in a, at least in Sweden, if we're looking strictly at this, but now we have Sweden in one of the, one of the, you know, Baltic uh, states that there, there seems to be a conflicting evidence, but the higher level of evidence is pointing towards a null effect. And, uh, you know, I would caution based on these results that perhaps you don't utilize this. Now, if you are seeking it, yeah, I don't know. The, the authors did talk about that in the discussion of like, hey, you know, people may be, may be wanting to use this and, you know, you just have to like, kind of like let them know. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fair. I think I think they're, what they reported was we know it's 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 at least safe that it doesn't interact with the chemotherapy. Yeah, that's true. We didn't talk about that. That's true. Mm-hmm. And that safety was really limited to these injection site reactions, these localized injection site reactions, which were minor. But otherwise, we did not see any sort of significant harms. And if they are still adamant on wanting to use this, based on this data, and and they do show the different types of chemotherapy regimens that were used. Um, that at least over this time frame, it, it appeared to be safe. Uh, however, we also know that clinical trials suck at reporting safety data. Yeah, that's true. Rare safety data in particular. And um, and so I don't know, I would take issue with, I think, the thought, your your statement that maybe lean away from it, just because the at the end of the day, we've got two trials, two randomized trials. They're not huge, about 300, 200, 300 people each. Um, the grade level just from precision because of the small size would be low. You'd probably rank down once or twice just for that. Uh, and one of the studies was high risk of bias. So, you know, I think um, still, even though this was a great study, still the grade level would probably be low for, for this result um, just because of the the overall size. And, you know, it could be that, you know, it could be null because of bias that was in the initial trial and this was addressed that. It could be null because, hey, randomness, and that's why we do meta-analyses. Could be, it could be different because of the patient populations, like they conjectured about access to palliative care. So these are all really good questions. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you now have a very good study conducted in a high-resource uh, available country that unfortunately did not see a signal at all um, with this intervention for advanced pancreatic cancer, despite promising previous results. And based on, on the language you used in this paper, a, a country and in, in medical system that is like kind of, I don't I caution to say in favor of, but accepting of, mm-hmm. of this intervention. And like, again, everything was set up to like have this work and it didn't. That's right. I think that's true. I, I got that same take. It's like, oh, these people really thought this was going to work and they wanted to do it more, more rigorously. And I didn't see any bias, but it was like, uh, you know, it wasn't certainly didn't see, appear biased in the other direction. Like one of those studies, like we're just going to prove that this herb doesn't work type of thing. I did not get that sense at all. No, no, no. I think sometimes when you read the introductions of paper, you kind of like you can tell know where it's going. I'm like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Like this was this is gonna be a negative trial and they're gonna set it up that way and yep there are the results and it's a negative trial and like, oh look at the conclusion yep yep no nope, yep they they did not want this to work this was the opposite they're like hey no this might work like we need to study this there's a lot of there's several meta analyses looking at it and everything's like the quality of data is just not there we're gonna make some high quality data they made high quality data and unfortunately you don't like the way that the cake tastes <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that could be true. And then another interesting thing, I find this idea of like why studies have divergent results fascinating. Um, One argument that I've seen for why the more we study something, the less impressive it looks is that you shift the population that you study, right? So sometimes you'll study the most severe cases first because there's no other option out there for them. And then you say, oh, it works for that. Let's try it for moderate. Let's try it for mild. And, and maybe it's just not as effective in those patient populations. That is not the case here, right? It's, it appears, to at least to me, that the study population was very similar, if not identical, to uh, the previous trial that really was set up to a- ask a, the same question in a similar population, just in a different country. And that's the only difference besides the blinding that we can kind of uh, chat about, besides just it being randomly different. Right, 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 right. Awesome. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's what we have to say for Mistletoe today. Thank you, Dr. Jacob Shore, for that great recommendation. You impressed Adam, and that's hard to do. (laughs) All right, we'll talk to you later. Bye, everybody.
If you enjoy this podcast, chances are that one of your colleagues and friends probably would as well. Please do us a favor and let them know about the podcast. And if you have a little bit of extra time, even just a few seconds, if you could rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts or any other distributor, it would be greatly appreciated. It would mean a lot to us and help get the word out to other people that would really enjoy our content. Thank you. Hey, y'all, this is Josh. You know, we talked about some really interesting stuff today. I think one of the things we're going to do that's relevant, there is a course we have on Dr. Journal Club called the EBM Boot Camp that's really meant for clinicians to sort of help them understand how to critically evaluate the literature, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the things that we've been talking about today. Go ahead and check out the show notes link. We're going to link to it directly. I think it might be of interest. Don't forget to follow us on social and interact with us on social media at Dr. Journal Club, DR Journal Club on Twitter. We're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. So please reach out to us. We always love to talk to our fans and our listeners. If you have any specific questions you'd like to ask us about research, evidence, being a clinician, et cetera, don't hesitate to ask. And then of course, if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on the pod, please let us know as well. Thank you for listening to the Dr. Journal Club podcast the show that goes under the hood of evidence-based integrative medicine. We review recent research articles, interview evidence-based medicine thought leaders, and discuss the challenges and opportunities of integrating evidence-based and integrative medicine. Be sure to visit www.drjournalclub.com to learn more.